But if the expectations are for you to act, it's more likely that you'll regret not acting. So this is one they said that action effect is actually reversed into an inaction effect based on expectations. How do you change expectations? They gave a few examples. One of the examples that they gave is if there is a negative outcome. So if you've already made a decision and that resulted in something negative, for example, soccer coaches, football coaches, if you've lost a game, everybody is expecting you to change the lineup. If you keep the exact same lineup, it's as if you, didn't, you don't care about losing. So just the fact that you've lost, there's an expectation that you'll do something, anything, in order to show that you're going to do better. And when you don't do this and you lose again, then you regret. In action effect, this is how they describe this. Prior outcomes may promote action and hence make uh, inaction more abnormal. Following negative primer, prior outcomes, more regret was attributed to inaction. So if something bad happened, you didn't act on it, and you lost again, then inaction is regretted more than action, which is exactly the opposite from the action effect. So they found a nice moderator, just like uh, Kit found the moderator. You know, he did a replication of a different moderator of whether it's short-term or long-term, whether it's about a decision that you've just made or something back, nostalgia in your life. See, prior outcome is positive. You won, you get exactly the same thing, more regret over action, but if they've lost, you see the reversal that more more people regret inaction. Okay, terrific. I replicated this a few times. So I also did like a study that combines action effect and inaction effect and social norms and normality and all this together. And you can see that really when we do this expectations, there is an effect that goes between Cohen's D of 0.39 to 0.81. So basically, uh, a robust effect when I do a mini meta analysis of all of the studies that I ran, which is four, then the effect is something like this 0.59. So expectations and other kinds of norms moderate the action effect. Okay, very simplified. So you're talking about vignettes, you're talking about soccer, judges, and all this. How does this apply to uh, real life? So I saw this this week. People use mental shortcuts to make difficult decisions, even highly trained doctors delivering babies. So they tracked hospitals, and this is what they found. Looking at two academic hospital data for more than 86,000 deliveries over 21 years, I saw that physicians who experienced complication during one patient's delivery were more likely to switch to another mode of delivery. So you can do a natural delivery, you can do a cesarean. So if something went wrong, in the previous patient, the cesarean went wrong. So even though the, the patient needs a cesarean, they'll switch anyway to the other one in order to not regret if something bad happens. So the more likely to switch to the other mode of delivery for their next patient, regardless of what the situation calls for. So rather than just being able to evaluate the patient for what it patient is, what's happening in the delivery, what happened before is actually influencing whether they're going to take action, switch to the different mode of delivery or not. It's kind of remarkable. So when we think about Monty Hall, or, you know, TV show, when you think about these vignettes, it's like, okay, so people are kind of like imagining a scenario that will never happen. This is real life. This is in hospitals. So sometimes you can see some of these effects generalizable to real life decisions. And this is amazing because this was published in the journal Science, which is top of the field you know people uh, this is a career changing kind of publication so very interesting findings over here uh, here's the from the actual article in science if you want to go and check it out this is what they wrote clinical decisions made in the delivery setting are often made under high pressure and great uncertainty and have serious consequences for mother and the baby and all sorts of theories about action inaction and all that this study investigates whether physician delivery mode uh, decisions are influenced by such heuristic. And then they found there is evidence that this heuristic has a small suboptimal effect on patients' health. So we need to work together with the doctors in order to show them that they're doing this kind of thing. And they're being affected, that their medical decision-making has all sorts of heuristics and biases. And actually sometimes they're hurting the mothers and the babies when they make such decisions, take the context of prior outcomes and expectations out of the equation so that they can really make the optimal decisions rather than be influenced by these biases. 
Yeah. So I just thought that was really uh, cute from from uh, from this week on how the stuff that we show in the classroom that we don't really know what's the relationship to real life. Um, some some great examples. And in your third uh, component, you'll need to kind of think about an intervention or think how what it is that we do here, default by a status quo effect, applies to actual real life circumstances and how this may affect other other people. Did, did we fix the camera? Oh, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, this week uh, we're talking about social cognition and cognitive blind spots. So for example, in this case, the doctors were not aware that they have some cognitive blind spot and that their decision-making is actually influenced by the other expectations. There's some, something that's going on that they're not seeing or they're not aware of that's really influencing them. And today we're going to uh, do some experiments on ourselves. So I want to ask you not to look at the slides or not look too much into the course summary. I want you to kind of like focus together with me on the riddles that I will show you. So we're going to do a lot of riddles. <laughs> I want you to try and solve these riddles. I know it's sometimes very frustrating. First time that I encountered these riddles, uh, sometimes I'm like, what the hell is going on? I don't even know how to approach this. But there's something in the thought process that will reveal something about your cognition and about your hidden you know, thought processes and your blind spots. So I'll ask you to go to the Mentimeter. First of all, I'll start with a very simple question, <laughs> whether you like riddles or not. Uh, be, be completely honest with me, that's, uh, that's fine. I just wanna know like where you are from. I hate riddles from minus 100 to I love riddles 100, just so we know kind of like uh, what the classroom vibe is. <laughs> We've got like people who are very passionate about riddles and people who are like hate this with passion. <laughs> so uh, interesting, it's, it's usually like you either really love them or you hate them. There's very few that are uh, like ambivalent in the middle, but good. We've got like uh, at least five, five of you that seem uh, at least mildly passionate about this, but even if you don't like riddles, uh, uh, not forcing you to do anything, but I do think it's more valuable if you actually try and think about these things together with me. I hope you like riddles because this class has a lot of riddles. <laughs> so we'll start with a simple question. Uh, anybody here should be able to like think about this. I don't know if how much you can see this. Can you see the? this stuff or at least in your mobiles or your laptops. So the question is, you write an email to your mom asking her to help solve a debate that you have with a classmate. And you ask 230 minus 220 times half equals what? And then you receive back an email from your mom with the following. You probably won't believe it, but the answer is, and this is the answer. Now, I'm asking you whether your mom is right or wrong. How many are familiar with this? Some of you are? Okay, good. All right. Before we go into the results, I will ask you the same kind of question. But this time, assume that this is a distinguished math professor. So you send this email to your professor and you get exactly the same answer. What do you think about the answer? Is your professor right or is your professor wrong? Now, before I show you the results, I'm gonna ask you, what is this about? What is the experiment here? Authority. Sorry? Like the authority. Who is more authority, mom or the professor? The professor. Really? Sorry. Who thinks mom is more authority? Who thinks professor is more authority? Unless your professor is a mom. <laughs> <laughs> so professor is more authority than a mom? I think so. Oh, okay. So what is it about authority? So what do you think that this, this is about? So that people are, even though it's against their like uh, understanding, but given that it's provided by an authority, they're more likely to think that's right. Mm. That's so your point. prediction here is? That people are going to somewhat think the probability of the professor being right is higher than your mom. Okay, yeah. yeah, good. Anything else going on over here? Are our mom and the professor actually right or wrong? 
How many of you think that mom and the professor are wrong? How many think that mom and the professor are right? Good. Why, why, why is mom and the professor right? It's uh, five, uh, exclamation mark. It's five factorial. Yes, so it's five exclamation mark. Oh, wow. So it's five times four Not cool. Not times cool. three Not cool. times two <laughs> times one. Now, the question is, first of all, we assumed that mom doesn't know anything. <laughs> Why is she saying that this is five? <laughs> um, so let's see what, what you wrote over here. Okay, so what is the likelihood? So only, oh, we have three saying definitely right. Okay, so more than the, just the, the one person. So that's good. <laughs> What's going to happen with the professor? More likely, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So more likely just because it's a professor authority, maybe they're, you know, they specialize in math, maybe there's something that we missed. So many of you did not see that, if I understood correctly, you did not see the five exclamation mark, which makes this the right answer. But somehow if it's a math professor and they tell us that this is right, then maybe we think again. Yes, so I was trying to help you to show you. It's technically correct in the most annoying way. Exactly. <laughs> First of all, it's supposed to show you a cognitive blind spot. So I was trying to help you by underlining both the five and the exclamation mark, but you ignored this and you ignored the exclamation mark. Put together, right? Well, the math professor probably should have written in proper grammar and add a full stop at the end, but I'm just saying. Two exclamation marks. Okay. But you, like, I, I, I took this from Twitter. <laughs> So this is, this is what I saw on Twitter. This is 2019. And I love this because it had 66.4K uh, likes and then a lot of retweets. And the answers to this, the replies to this Twitter were so angry <laughs> and frustrated. <laughs> so this is kind of like, you know, this person is like, oh, now, now I know. It took them a while to realize that there's actually like the right way. To, to look at this and there's a possibility that this might be, might be correct. And I thought, okay, so we can do an experiment with this in class. What would be uh, the kind of person that you'll you know, ignore advice from? So why did I choose mom? Then we don't think of mom as an expert in, in math and we often tend to disregard uh, some advice about stuff like that. All right. Uh, that's a good uh, start to this. Uh, uh, warning you in advance, there's going to be a little bit more of these frustrations <laughs> coming up. So think carefully when you answer these kinds of things. Okay. The same distinguished math professor sends you and your classmates the following email with the title, what is the name of the fifth kid? This one you must know. It was very, it's like a big meme that exploded everywhere. So the email's body is, Cindy has five kids, first kid's name is, second kid is, third kid's. And then the question is, what would you reply? So this is an open question. So feel free to answer in any way that you like. What is the answer to this riddle? Okay, we have one answer. Okay, so originally I've indicated that I like riddles. I would like to uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> What's frustrating about this one? Seems pretty straightforward, no? Well, because it's probably not me, and <laughs> you're just going to be like, oh, look, you missed that, and I'm just like, oh, not cool. <laughs> Great. So first of all, there's a trick here, right? So you're already assuming, based on the one before, just before, you know, you had a prior outcome that was negative, and now you're taking action <laughs> by switching your mode, and even switching whether you like riddles or not. So we, we see a real-life implication of action in action effect. But here you already understand that perhaps the answer is not may. Now, what could be the trick here? Do we have some more answers? Okay, we have six answers. What could be the trick here? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. No, but that, that's a good point. I missed that. Okay, so I, I have some cognitive blind spots as well. Good. What, what else? So we've got what is the name of? 
Sydney have five kids. Uh, first kid's name is January second. So I'm going to show you uh, a couple. I became aware of this couple on YouTube after they went viral with millions of views. This one is the first one that exploded, but then it became sort of like a thing where they asked the guy to ask his girlfriend even more of these riddles to see her frustration. Now, it might seem a little bit aggressive over here with a bit of cussing and uh, you know, sorts of negative attitudes, but let me reassure you, there are loving couples, they love each other very much. And all this is done in good spirits, okay? So the first example of an interaction of this couple. Cindy has four kids. The first kid's name is January, yeah? yeah? Second kid is February. Third kid is March. Fourth kid is April. What is the name of the fifth kid? May. No. Why not? Because it's not. <laughs> what do you think it's May for? January, February, March, April, May. No, <laughs> it's not May, yet. You're not what? listening to what I'm saying, are you? I am! You know. Do you know any other days of the month, Spread? Months of the days, whatever you want to call them. Names? Names of the month? Yeah, that. Yeah? So I don't. April? Yeah? Yeah? It's the last name of the kid. Fourth yeah? Fourth kid. Yeah? So what is the name of the fifth kid? It's going to be called May, isn't it? She ain't going <laughs> to call anything else. It's she ain't going to skip May and go, I oh, will call you June then. It's not Aren't May. We? It's not June. It's not any day of the month. It's not a month. December. It's not a month. It's a kid's name Cindy after her. What? I'm so calling a kid named Cindy. After her? No. She's... Listen to what I'm Cindy saying, Jen. Junior. Listen carefully. because you. Okay, so this goes on for a while. You can see it goes on for three minutes where she's frustrated and she's trying to understand what it is that he wants from her. Now, what could be a possible trick here? Did anybody have any ideas? Okay, got it. Okay, so... Let's go back to your Mentimeter and see what you, where is this? Okay, here we are. May, 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 and then what? So the person who wrote what got the correct answer. Uh, okay. So there is no question mark after the last one. So what? is the name of the fifth kid. So what is the cognitive blind spot here? We see a question mark even when there's no question mark. So we fill in the gaps. It's a bit like a visual illusion where we see something that's actually not really there. So we just assume it's a question, but that's not part of the question. The question was in the title that you got from the professor, but actually in the hope there was a statement. What is the name of the fifth kid? What can we learn from this? Wait, sorry, why is there a question mark? Where? No, that's that's a title, but in the email body, the body of the message, there is no there's no question mark at the end. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So I took this from YouTube. What's what makes this so fascinating? Why can't she see it, even if he explains this to her again and again? Something about the word what that automatically makes your brain add a Yeah. First of all, how many people are really named what? Not many. So availability heuristic, we just like, it's not available. Therefore, we can't elicit this kind of thing as an example. Plus, what is a question word? So we just assume if there's what, that at the end, there's a question mark. It's very difficult for us to switch our mind when or, you know, we have some kind of a pattern. And even though we understood, like you understood, there's a trick here, it's not me, right? So how can we get out of this in order to see something different? In many other experiments, it's kind of like controversial now, but traditionally in psychology, being able to think outside the box was considered to be kind of like a measure of creativity. And now we know it's not so simple. As, as that. Um, do you want to see other examples from this couple? There's a lot of them. <laughs> I took some of those. Um, so for example, who has the money? I'll show you this one. Yes. John yeah. had 200,000 pounds. Yes. Mary has 5,000 pounds. Right. Mark will have yes. half a million pounds. What's the difference? Somebody has, somebody has. 
somebody will have. But there's a pattern. So he says, has, has, will have, and she is not able to hear the will have. So her response is, who has the most money? The half a million pounds. <laughs> no, Jen, you're a, you are name? dumb. Mark, Mark has half a million what pounds. Has he got the what has he got the most? Because, yeah, if I had Mary, 5,000 pounds, or if I had John with 200,000 pounds. Yeah, so how many legs do you have? What's going to be the, the trick over here? So here's the question. <laughs> Can you just do this? No. Well, I know you want to go out and it to me and say, oh, you have five cows, yeah. two dogs, yeah. and one cat. Yeah. How many legs do you have? How many legs do I have? So what's the answer? Two. But what does she do? You get a lot of irrelevant information and you think it has something to do with the actual question. But actually, the only thing that he was looking at is how many legs do you have? Another example for this. It's about a birthday. When is your birthday? Right, so the question is, I will say it to you slowly. Your birthday yes. is on the same date every year. Yes, I know that. Right. I, you know that. Right, know so that. when's your next birthday if you were born on Christmas Day? Saturday, the 16th of May. <laughs> so what is your birthday if you were born on Christmas Day? So he's actually asking for what is Christmas Day, but she hears his birthday. And she thinks it's about your birthday. So she answers her own birthday, which happens to be that week when they did this uh, whole, whole thing between them. And just the reaction. All right. So now you're getting kind of like uh, the blind spots and all sorts of patterns. And it will increase complexity uh, bit by bit. But it's important to see what kind of uh, patterns we have. So sometimes it's too much information. Sometimes you know, irrelevant information. Sometimes we don't notice an information that is there. Sometimes we complete information based on our prior knowledge. All right, hospital. How is this possible? Open answers welcome. A man and his son are driving along and get into a bad car accident. The ambulance shows up and takes them both to the hospital. The son is rushed into surgery. The doctor who will perform the surgery enters the operating room. But as soon as the doctor sees the patient, the doctor says, I can't operate on this boy. He is my son. How is this possible? Now, there could be, there could be all sorts of answers here. Um, wh whatever comes to mind, all sorts of ways to solve this. All right, to help you with this question, I'm gonna give you some more examples based on stuff that I found on YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, <laughs> and so forth. Let's solve this thing together, not on Mentimeter. What's the answer? Sorry? They have different? The size of the pizza, the size of the pizza right? That's, that's terrific. So that's, that's one solution. We just assume that the pizza is the same size of pizza. And the nice thing is that somebody posted this as a teacher gave this on a test. Reasonable, Marty ate and Louis ate, Marty ate more pizza. How is this possible? And a student wrote, Marty's pizza is bigger than Louis's pizza. So your answer. And what did the teacher do? No, that is not possible because five, six is greater than four, six. So Louis ate more. So sometimes the way that we ask questions in multiple choice exams, in quizzes like this, we just assume that everybody's going to see the, the question the way that we do, but sometimes there's other ways to interpret this just like you did. So sometimes the kids or people who are blank slates and were not corrupted by our uh, thinking process actually come out with a more creative way of looking at this, which is something to keep in mind when you're designing the call checks for your participants. You really need to think with every question in every scenario it's like, how are my participants going to see this? One of the reasons why we're doing pretests and why I will ask you to run this on maybe some of your family or your friends is in order for you to get some feedback on how others are seeing your own qualtrics. So sometimes we just assume, you know, everybody knows it's the same pizza, but then sometimes we got answers like that. It's not the same pizza. I'll give you another example where kids see things that we don't see. 
Um, yeah, an orchestra of 120 players takes 40 minutes to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. How long would it take 60 players to play the symphony? Yeah, how about this one? This is going to be a bit more of a challenge to you. So apparently 80% of the kids were able to answer this brain teaser, which is a geographical element. Which way is the bus driving, to the left or to the right? It's very easy for kids because they get, at least on the US, in the US, they get on these school buses every day. So how do you know left or right? Let's see what the kids say. Because it's difficult for us to process Monday, this. it's time for a brain game. Check out the bus on your screen. If the bus started moving forward, which direction would it move? Left or right? Stumped? Nearly 80% of children under 10 got it instantly. Because we are smart that way. Because the door is on the other side. <laughs> we'll tap into your common sense yeah. on the new episode of Brain Game. So sometimes our experience of how we board the bus or so when we see this kind of bus and we want to, you know, which, which way is going. So we just, uh, we can imagine very easily which way, which way is the door. They know which way is the door because they see where the path is and where they need to come up from the other side. So the door is on the other side. So they know that this is going to go left because it's in the US. If it would be in somewhere, someplace else, it's uh, within the opposite direction. Uh, let's go back to uh, the riddles. There's a barber, the barber question. In Nevada, the town one horse has one barber in the whole town. For some reason, one of the laws in the town is that every man in town must be clean shaven. Further, every man either must shave himself or be shaven by the barber. And the barber may only shave those who don't shave themselves. So the question is, who shaves the barber? This should be the simplest. The accountant. So an accountant says, that attorney is my brother. And that is true. They really do have the same parents. Yet the attorney denies having any brothers. And that is also true. How is this possible? So you're smiling because you know the answer to all of these. Yeah, it's the same answer. Good. You knew this from before, you identified the pattern in the first question, the second question, or the third question. Okay, good. So when did you identify the pattern or the problem? From the first one, that's great. Because sometimes it takes us a, a while, so maybe we don't see this in the first one, but after we see the second one, we're like, oh, there's something going on over here. And then our mind kind of makes a mental connection. And like, oh, now we know what's going on over here. How many are, are still stomped and don't know where this is going? Sorry? You don't, you don't know where this is going? Oh, you just got it? Okay. So here's the question that will help you get this for all of you. Here's another version of the hospital question. This time, it's a woman and her son are driving along and getting into a bad car accident. The ambulance shows up and takes them both to the hospital. The son is rushed into surgery. The doctor who will perform surgery enters the operating room. But as soon as the doctor sees the patient, the doctor says, I can't operate on this boy. He is my son. So what am I building on here? What are these supposed to show? Yeah, gender stereotypes, terrific. So, so what did we see in the first one? Let's go back to the first one. Yeah, so this one over here in the first hospital, we have a man and his son. What's, what's creating the, the, the clash? Why can't we resolve this at first glance? Because we just assume, what are we assuming? Yeah, that the surgeon is male. Right? Although it, yeah. Plus, we can also be assuming, I, I, yeah, not, what are we assuming? The other surgeon might also be male, but it's also possible that it may be a surgeon. Very good, because I don't often get that, that kind of response. Wait, so, what do you say again? Do you want to explain? 
like some people have to die. Yes. Oh, that's what you were saying. Oh, so yeah. first of all, we assume. I just answered one and two. Oh, a stepdad. Okay. That's also very creative. Well, this is all supposed to be car accident, but the dad wasn't hurt. And yeah. the son was hurt. That's <laughs> I what I know. I think the usual version of this question has the dad die or something. Okay. So th is this what, what you answered? The nine people who answered? Let's see what, the, what you answered. All sorts of creative answers. The doctor is his mom. Okay. His mom, his mom. There's another operator. <laughs> okay. And the boy has two dads. Terrific, very good. Because the doctor is also the oh wow, that's <laughs> doctor is also the dad that got into the car accident. The dad wasn't injured. Wow, that's elaborate. Okay, got it. Yeah. So up until I showed this in the Netherlands, nobody ever answered the two dads. And up until now in Hong Kong, until this classroom, usually I don't get the you know two dads or uh, you know, the stepdad, I think it's the first time that I, that I get this kind of response. So we have all sorts of things that are biasing us over in this question. First, gender, gen, gender roles about what the surgeon is, just assuming that a surgeon is male. And then assuming, you know, that there's a mother and a father, you know, rather than two, two dads, or assuming all kinds of things about, you know, there's just one set of parents rather than two sets of parents. Amazing. So you're already getting very good at seeing all kinds of blind spots. So our mind makes initial connections very fast, intuitive responses, which create the clash, and then we can't resolve this. But if we really look at this and we think about what are we missing? So it's not May. What is the answer in, if it's not May? And then we look at what is the piece that we're missing? Oh, there's no, there's no question mark at the end of the, the fifth the fifth kid. So it's it's you know getting increasingly easy. The more that I show you some of these, you, it will become easier and easier for you to answer some of these. Now what, what's happening? Uh, one thing I wanted to show you about this, another person that I followed, first it was in on TikTok when that was available in Hong Kong, but then uh, that was taking away from us. So I follow on and now they have YouTube shorts. So just to show the two versions, we have a woman and her son, a man and his son, stereotype consistent, stereotype inconsistent. So the article that I took this from, and I'll show you what article this is, it's, um, yeah, read all me this, I'll show you. Um, so this is an actual article, this was published. You can do research on this, you can show all kinds of things on this. It actually meant this kind of thing, but like you said, there's other, other ways to solve that. Uh, this is the doctor that I follow. And she gets a lot of uh, you know, hate comments or criticism, or she shares what's happening to her in the hospital when she shows up. So when she shows up, people, first of all, call her by all sorts of uh, demeaning names. They don't call her doctor. They just assume that she's something else. What do they assume that she is? Put your head on. A nurse, a student, a drug rep not the doctor she comes in there's no reason why she can't be the doctor but just because she is female and because whatever they they see so she's the doctor and she does all kinds of these very very quick uh tiktoks that's some bush <laughs> the last one that's supposed to be about baby Girl, free up your body Stop passing crazy Put my money Spend all the good times daily Try and put it Got my hat in shady What's that supposed to be about baby Our blind spots our cognitive processes are also affecting the way that we that we treat that we treat others uh, I see now on Twitter in the academic Twitter the people that I associate myself with uh, there's lots of females that put on their Twitter handles, professor this and that. I don't put professor, I just put my name. But I have the privilege of being male and just people assuming that if I'm an academic, I'm a professor. But a lot of uh, women that don't put professor or doctor in front of their names are just not being treated as doctors or professor. Are you the secretary, the assistant of a professor? You're a student? So... It's very important for us to try and understand what the cognitive bias is, gender role, or 
you know, LGBT related uh, issues, and then how we can help others overcome this uh, when, when they, uh, they are faced with these kinds of situations. What's the solution for this one? Very similar. The barber doesn't have what? Yeah. Genetic reasons or okay. Yeah. <laughs> Genetic reasons or or just because they're they're, they're not biologically. Yes. Okay. So that's the consistent uh, pattern. Um, <laughs> no, the barber is a lady. Yeah, barber shaves himself, but you can't do this contradiction. The barber is female. His wife. Okay, but the thing about the genetic uh, stuff, this is the first time that I hear this. But the 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 thing that they meant to say is that the barber is female and therefore does not need to be shaved. But it's difficult for us to see this because there's so much man, male, you know, showing up in the, in the question that we just assume you know, the question is about that. How about the accountant? <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah so, so what, what's stopping here? What's the clash? The clash is we assume that. What are we assuming? Both of them are male, but it could be that. Yes, the color is female. Good. <laughs> okay, terrific. I like this this one. She's a girl. The color is female. Sister. Huh? <laughs> okay. The color is sister. Okay, that color is a girl. Terrific. So I think you're kind of like getting the hang of it. Uh, we'll take a 10 minute, minute break and then we'll come back to the final set of riddles for us to overcome our cognitive biases. Yeah, so this is, uh, so back to this uh, article, stereotype consistent, this is how it was framed over there. So they came, they came across uh, stumpers um, and they wanted to show how we frame, scientifically frame, what is it that stumps us? What is it that clashes? So they have the dominant construal, what it is that elicits in our mind. The accountant is male. And the alternate construal, which is much more difficult for us to come up with, the accountant is female. And all sorts of reasons of what causes the dominant construal, in this case, gender stereotypes. Uh, some professions are mentally general. Maybe you're familiar with this. Are you familiar with the implicit association test? Have you ever taken this, seen, seen how it, somebody did not have a chance to see implicit association test? Okay, so yeah. Okay, so I'll just show you. It's, it's very quick to show. One indirect way is looking at riddles. Another indirect way, which is considered to be more scientifically accurate, is where we measure response times to all sorts of stimuli. So now you can go on uh, Project Implicit. Uh, I think it's Harvard that said the whole thing. Brian Osek, before he did the Center of Open Science, he's the person uh, who was, uh, you know, came, came up with this platform and did a lot of research on this. Hundreds of millions of people took this. I'm going to show you uh, an example. Are you familiar with the Inquisit? Maybe some of you, maybe some of you uh, will work or are working in a lab that uses Inquisit. And in Inquisit, we set up stimuli and we're able to measure very, very accurately in uh, milliseconds the kind of response, response time. So I'll show you what that looks like. This one measures gender career implicit association test. Okay, so this is what it looks like. You have four categories, family and career. Under family, there's home, parents, children, family, marriage, wedding, relatives. So every time you see the word home parents, you're supposed to categorize this with family. In terms of career, you have management, professional, corporation, salary, office, business, career. So all these are affiliated with career. And then you have female names like Julia, Michelle, Anna, Emily, Rebecca, and you have male names, Ben, John, Daniel, Paul, and Jeffrey. So what you do is you take the keyboard and you put one finger on the left and one finger on the right. And then you're supposed to categorize different stimuli into the category on the right or the category on the left. So in this case, you do the E and the I. And when you're ready, you start with a space bar. So for example, it shows up Emily and you need to respond as fast as possible. Which category does this belong to? Is it, fe is it female or male? So you do E, E, E. 
John. So every time you do this, it measures two things. One is it measures uh, how fast, and second, it measures accuracy because you can make mistakes. So hits and misses. It, so the first, the first one is, is looking at the female male categories. After you're done with this session, it has family and career. So this is a training session. So you're supposed to put uh, management into career and then parents into family, family, children, wedding. And then once again, it looks at all of these. But when everything really starts is here. When they're going to show you stimuli that's either male, female, or family career, and you need to be able to uh, put this in the right, in the right uh, side. Now, in this case, career or male seems to be aligned with gender stereotypes, where you know, family, female, also aligned with gender stereotypes. So very quickly, we should be able to put them in the right category. But when we do career with female and family with male, what you can see is people take a lot longer to respond. The extent to which, you know, the longer that it takes them to respond when it's gender inconsistent or the more misses, you know, the more false responses that they get is how we measure to what extent a person is implicitly biased. Is that clear? So I'll show you an example over here. It could be office. So I need to put this into career and then Ben and management and Jeffrey, children. So that's the way that we measure uh, implicit association test. And uh, you have a, a bunch of these. Uh, if you want to do this, um, typically the first implicit association test with, with uh, race, uh, good, bad, and then a white person and a black person. So unfortunately, it seems like there is a very strong bias against. Uh, so if you have uh, age, aggression, anger, anxiety, arousal, all sorts of things. So you can download these, run the demos, see how this works. Uh, but the most famous one is race. Yeah. Guilty, not guilty, not guilty. <laughs> a person should be guilty or not guilty. So it really shows some of the biases. Now we know that there's all sorts of problems with the implicit association test. Okay, stumpers. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you an example video. That's another uh, famous TikTokers that, that I'm following and they're very uh, humorous. Uh, so they're, they're, they're very cute. They never show the man. Uh, they always show the, the, the woman and she's always kind of trying to um, elicit something with him because he's really, really funny. And, Okay, man rides into town. Man. A man. Oh, I thought his name was man. <laughs> no, a man. Can you just let Such me... a horrible name for a guy. What's your son's name? Man. A man no rides man. into town on Wednesday. Okay. He leaves three days later on Wednesday. How what does he do that? What did he... So a man rides into town on Wednesday. He leaves three days later on Wednesday. How does he do that? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> that is the answer, yeah. So he rides on Wednesday coming into that. <laughs> so our assumption of how we associate this whole thing, but they make this into this very humorous interaction. He already knows how, he, how she's, uh, you know, all the challenges. So he's able to already make fun of her by creating a, another riddle. You ride in on? A horse. You sound scratchy today. Why? I'm horse. <laughs> Are you telling me jokes while I'm in the middle of telling you a riddle? This You're works. taking this too far. Okay, Wednesday, went into the bar. <laughs> and then he said, the bartender said, hey. And Wednesday said, yes. happily, you read my mind. <laughs> Did you just abandon ship on Wednesday? Everybody Monday? knows the horse's name is Wednesday, man. I'm just giving you content to make fill your one minute video. I don't know what to do with you. He said such obvious things. What can I do? So I had to think up two nice horse jokes to put in the middle of the Wednesday riddle. Um, case of stompers. Okay, let's do... So hopefully that will uh, prepare you for the new riddles that we have coming up. Where's the new riddles? Okay, here we have the new riddles. Oh, we have the pizza. We did this already. Okay, speeding car. How is this possible? So a big brown cow is lying down in the middle of a country road. The street lights are not on, the moon is not out, and the skies are heavily clouded. A truck is driving towards the cow at full speed. 
its headlights are off. Yet the driver sees the cow from far easily and avoids hitting it even without even having to break hard. How is this possible? We don't know the gender of the cow. <laughs> maybe it had an operation, maybe not, it's not clear. What is the name of the cow, Wednesday? Yeah, already have some responses, good. All right, another, another one, different style, a bus ride. Individual bus rides cost $1 each. A card that's good for five rides costs $5. A first time passenger boards the bus alone and hands the driver $5 without saying a single word. Yet the driver immediately realizes for sure that the passenger wants the card rather than the single ride and change. How is that possible? No answers. This is a bit more difficult than the previous one, right? What makes this very difficult? What kind of an assumption can we have over here? Okay, think about that. I know this one is difficult. Next one, <clears throat> potato bags. It's a bit similar to the one before. So in a Bangladesh market, a small potato bag costs five taka, a medium potato bag costs seven taka, and a large potato bag costs nine taka. Yet a single potato in that market costs 10 taka. How is that possible? What's our assumption here? What is the clash? I think this is the simplest of those. Every morning, the farmer had eggs for breakfast. He owned no chickens and he never got eggs from anybody else's chickens. Where did he get the eggs? Okay, good, we have three. So I'll move to the other one. While walking across a bridge, I saw a boat full of people, yet on the boat, there wasn't a single person. Why? All right, so let's go back to the speeding car. What, what is the problem here? Sensory cue here is the visual cue, but mm -hmm. instead the cow lying down might not be sleeping, it may actually be alive and making moon sound. But the, yes, the driver sees a cow in the car. Is there some sort of like the cow is glowing? <laughs> the driver sees the cow from afar easily and avoids hitting it. The cow was hit by the clear Sorry. So, so what is skewing our perception here? What is our blind spot in this scenario? So we've got the street lights are not on, the moon is not out, and the skies are heavily clouded. Why are you not supposed to be able to see the car? Because we assume there are no other light sources in this scenario, but actually there might be like skyscrapers that actually have lights, but there are not. Daytime. Why did we assume that this is nighttime? Because the thing about the clouds and the moon kind of cues. Nighttime. Yeah, right. But there's nothing here that indicates that this is nighttime. We just assume that this is nighttime. But even if it's nighttime, you can still see it. Though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so is that what you answered? That is that what the eight people? Uh, okay. Because it's daytime. It's daytime. Good. So some of you did come up with this. Um, uh, not using the road. <laughs> Other cars have headlights on, so maybe other cars are in there. Okay. The cow is okay. Yeah, some like creative, creative stuff over here. Good. Interesting. So basically, this stomper was supposed to create the illusion that this is talking about nighttime, whereas there's nothing in the scenario that actually indicates uh, um, you know that this is nighttime. And this creates sort of like the clash. So our ability to overcome some assumption because of some information that was that was given. What about this uh, bus ride? How to overcome this one? I think this was uh, more, more difficult. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah, that's, uh, I'll, I'll take your answer, thank you. Okay, got it. What other explanations? 
Because yeah, normal reason is what? What does he see? Because if you see five dollars, then nobody will use five dollars, and then he return four dollars to you, and then we're just one black. Why not? What do you mean? So you have five coins. Oh, you have five coins. Why do you have five coins? Where does it say that? It could be a five dollar bill, yeah. or five dollar coin. But but this is relevant. Or how about? Wait wait let, let, let her finish. This is relevant. So we assumed, I assumed this when I read this, that he just gives a five dollar bill, which makes it very very difficult to interpret. But if they give five dollar in coins, or some, or then the question is, why didn't you give me one coin? If you gave me five coins, that means that I want the card. Yeah. So actually, you kind of like had, had the right direction. Is that what you had in mind? So just, just the fact that this is broken apart, so that you broke apart the five, yeah. indicating that you want, you don't just want the one right, yeah. you want five right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Did, did you not get it? Did you understand? Sure? Okay. Yeah, that was that was very, really difficult. This is the, the, the hardest one over here. So in order, so what is our assumption? Our assumption is we didn't consider the possibility that there were five coins that indicate $5. Because if you already think about the option of five coins, then it's much clearer for the driver to interpret, right? So we need to overcome our assumption of what the sum is, which brings us to the next one. What is the next one? Potato bags. So what is our assumption here? Well, that, well, that wasn't the answer. <laughs> wait, wait, so what I assumed was that... Wait, a small potato bag costs five taka. Yeah, they each only have one potato within the bag. But, but, but the one in the bag is 10, 10 taka. What do you mean? No, no, a I'm potato is that, 10. I'm saying that regardless of the potato bag size, they all yeah. each only have one potato. <laughs> yeah, but the one potato is 10 taka. So why is it yes, so cheap? So the 10 taka one has a large potato bigger than the one put, that's put in the bag of nine. The size of the potato. Yes. That's what I'm <laughs> Okay. That makes sense, right? It sounds like you have an answer. It's only the bag, which is what you said, right? Yeah. It's so only the bag. So we assume okay. if there's a bag, it has to be at least one in there. Uh, but even if it's <laughs> one, like the different size potato, that makes sense. Different right? size potato, yeah. But we have the assumption. The bag doesn't, doesn't... If we says a potato bag rather than just a bag, the potato bag has to include potatoes, right? But it doesn't. It could be empty. It's, it's, it's not really just an assumption, or it's not literally a <laughs> potato. What do you mean? A potato bag has to be full of something, or it could yeah, be empty. I still think my answer is valid. Yeah. There's an assumption of like all of the potatoes are the same, the same size. So I didn't indicate. There's just well, the single potato in that market, but it could be mini potatoes i don't know you can come up with all sorts of different things so it's good that you came up with something creative you overcame some assumption that we had over here it took a while but you came up with it okay so maybe there's no potato in in each one of these bags this one that should be the simplest one what could be the solution here okay yeah good so what is the assumption here Kind of like it's the thing that comes to mind. That's the uh, availability heuristic, the, the thing that is elicited the most, but it could be. Wait, let, let's see. I'm actually curious to see. What did you write over here? Bag is cheaper than potato, the single potato. <laughs> okay, so over here, market, huh? Restaurant. <laughs> Okay, I see. Got it. But I like I like the I like the ducks and the ostrich. Uh, that's that's pretty good. The farmer buys this from the market. Did you ever have ostrich eggs? No. It's like each one of those is like twenty. It's like uh, you can <laughs> like a big one. <laughs> okay. This is the this is tricky. This is like a silly word game. What is the silly word game here? It's, they're, they're well, what? What well, what? I saw a boat full of people. What do you mean? Yet on the boat there wasn't. Oh, on the boat there wasn't. Okay. Uh, yet on the boat. Okay. 
inside the balloon, okay? Sorry? Say again? So on the boat is one aspect of the sentence that might be fooling us. What else might be fooling us? <laughs> there wasn't, there wasn't, yeah. The person has what? <laughs> Pretty good. Like when, I, when I'll tell you the answer, you're gonna say, what? Uh, so let's go back to this. Uh, so answer, it's daytime. Passenger gave five coins of $1, empty bags and his ducks and they're all married. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but how but how do we do this scientifically we can actually look at what you know what aspect of the the sentences people look at the most so we can break this apart you know we have this uh, regarding the accountant the speeding car the bus ride the potato so we look at again at dominant control the alternative control and what causes the dominant control and then we can ask people what comes to mind when we give you this sentence so on the boat, let's ask people, where do they perceive the people? So you draw a boat and say, where do you think the people are? So maybe they'll come up. Okay, they're on the boat. They're in the boat rather than on the boat. So over here, you can see, for example, what did you see in your mind's eye? So please describe to us when we say this sentence to you. So scientific articles in psychology, uh, social psychology or cognition are really interested in what do people, you know, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Their immediate reactions when you give them no, an accountant. So most people see males, 71%. Uh, far fewer see, uh, you know, immediately see a female accountant. When it comes to a nurse, 95% see a female. Potato bag, a bag of potatoes, you know, 99%. It's very, very difficult for people to see, you know, just an empty bag. So we can measure this quantitatively and design experiments based on that. So typically we have first study in order to try and understand how do people perceive this scenario, try and make sure you know, that we got this correctly. And then we can manipulate all sorts of things in order to create a stumper that will have a clash and create the cognitive blind spot. So I really like this kind of stuff. There's a few, a few directions that we, we did this uh, in our team. Uh, fun stuff, it's really, it's really fun to play with this. It just goes to show that you can measure all sorts of things implicitly by using this very, very simple experimental uh, method. So go, go into this one, the last one. Consider two individuals, Anne and Barbara, who graduated from the same college a year apart. Upon graduation, both took similar jobs with publishing firms. Anne started a yearly salary with uh, 30,000. During her first year of the job, there was no inflation. In the second year, Anne received a 2% $600 raise in salary. Barbara also started the yearly salary of 30,000 during her first year on the job, there was 4% inflation. And in her second year, Barbara received a 5% raise in salary. As they enter the second year of the job, who do you think is happier, Anne or Barbara? So what is this about? Should be fairly easy for you to observe what the experiment is about. What am I asking about? What, 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 what are we measuring here? What's the difference between Anne and Barbara? Yeah. First impression? First impression? Yeah, what do you mean? Like, like, one is like 600, one is like that, and it's like 1,500, but it's got lower. So we're not really clear how much is lower. So it still kind of feels like 4%. I feel like it's lower than 600. So it's like, so like it's like it's up in my mind for some perceiving that on the base rate. Kind of like base rate or a correction to a sum of money. You wanted to say something? Yes, relative and absolute. So what do you see here? What's the difference? Yeah, there's an. Zero inflation, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, so what, what's your hypothesis here? So one of them doesn't have any inflation and what she gets is what she gets. The other person has inflation. So after she gets something, she needs to correct for the inflation, right? Okay, so of these two, let's say net, how much I get, how much I earn, which one gets more? Yeah, Anne is getting more than Barbara. Who is gonna be happier? Barbara, why? Yeah, so they only emphasize the 1,500 and they completely ignore, disregard what the inflation is, which we sometimes do. I mean, I moved many times around the world for different types of inflation. Hong Kong salaries are good in general compared to other places in the world, but they're unbelievably good when you take into consideration the taxes. Taxes in Israel could be up to 50%. You know, in the Netherlands, 40%, 35%. What's the tax rate in Hong Kong? You'll need to know this when you graduate. It's very important. Sorry? Yeah, on the highest category, it gets to 15, 17%. It starts from much lower than that. But yeah, so unbelievable. So most people compare salary. Okay, how much am I going to get in Hong Kong? How much am I going to get in the US? How much am I going to get in Israel and then Europe? And then, you know, Hong Kong comparable to the US. Take into account the tax. Hong Kong is doing much better. Similar things with Singapore, yeah. Cost of living, for sure. Yeah, so what do you think about that as well? Yes. Excellent point, good. So when you think about the salaries that you're getting or which place to go in the world, or if you're thinking graduate school or wherever, you need to take into consideration all sorts of things. But legally speaking, yes. you just need to stay in Hong Kong for six months plus one day. So like over half a year in yeah. that year in order for you to use the Hong Kong tax rate. And then like other than that, you can travel around the world to different places. Given that you can work from home and Hong Kong. And you also oh, to have your tax base in Hong yes. Kong and then, yeah. That's based on my understanding. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, I think some people are starting to get here. So I'll just summarize. So this is basically to say that most of us ignore things like cost of living. We ignore inflation rates. However, these are very, very important for us when we make decisions. So um, this is the first one. We're not going to go into this, but if you want, you can go into that later. And this actually... Uh, you can see all the, the, the HKU students and the teaching assistant uh, who is now in the Netherlands. Uh, so we replicated this and, and that worked really well. And this is uh, by Tversky, the same Tversky with Kahneman and Tversky and Shafir. And the second one that I wanted to talk to you about also Shafir and Tversky that we also replicated, it's called the money illusion. And people uh, typically ignore. So they look at absolute, but they don't look at, at net gains. Uh, and it decreases, you know, the affects all sorts of things like happiness, job satisfaction. And it's very, very important that when you consider your salaries or where you're going in the world and all your benefits, you know, where you're going and the kind of bonuses that you will get, that you put this nice table and you take everything into account and that you conclude. So how much is going to be raised the following year and the year after that? Especially if it's a long-term job, you want to be able to know how your salary is adjusted and take that into consideration when you're thinking about your income long-term. So the whole point of this article is to say our cognitive blind spot is that we don't make these calculations. We just immediately go for the information that's available, but there is information that we need to include, that we need to know that usually is not provided to us by the employer, not provided to us by society. We need to do the legwork in order to to, to do the research and know what these are in order to incorporate this in our decisions. That kind of sounds uh, an interesting uh, session for us about cognitive blind spots, about things that we don't see and maybe we should pay more attention to and why these clashes with all sorts of intuitions and immediate gut, re gut reactions. Hope that was interesting for you. We'll keep going uh, deeper into more experimental paradigms and even more uh, interesting uh, activities in the following weeks. 
replications and extensions, if you have any questions, starting for something very, very simple, you know, scale or how to do this or something about your extension, please ask us. I'll try and be very responsive to help you out with your projects. See you next week.